Okay, good. All right. Um, can we start with prayer? You're in a bishop, right? Go for it. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to be here this time to pray. Please pray be with us and help us to learn. Help us be prepared. We pray for Brother Ruggs and grateful for his efforts. Give thanks to thee and ask thy help as we prepare for the future. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so I just want to make sure that this is still working. Yes, it is. Okay. 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 All right. Um, so this is the reason I'm showing you this. Has anybody here seen this lecture that Becca has? Did you watch it online? Because I haven't presented it in town. Oh. Online. You have seen it online. Okay, so it's a little different than the one you saw online. It's better. And uh, this is, I'm just doing this for you guys for background. So we talk about the other topic we're going to talk about. You'll, you'll have a sense of where I'm coming from. Make sense? Okay. All right. Thanks uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, we're going to get right into this. One of the things when we talk about the new economy, um, we talk a lot about this concept called library education. So I just take a second at the beginning to explain what library education is. So as we're going through this, we're all on the same page. So when we talk about the history of education, we're talking the beginning of Western civilization, Greeks and Romans and all that. We had this thing called liberal arts. And the idea of liberal arts is, um, well, liber is the root word for liberal, meaning abundant. It's the root word for liberty. It's the root word for library. And so um, back in the day, back in ancient times, you were kind of either, um, you, you were in a state of liberty or you weren't, right? So the liberal arts are the idea of being able to read, to write, engage in contract, own property, defend yourself in a court of law, be able to hold your ground in a legislature. Kind of in ancient times, you know, you were either, you were either owning property or you were the property, right? And so this idea of liberal arts was a big deal. 1,000, 1,500 years later, we kind of turned it into kind of she-she education, kind of bourgeoisie education, and we got away from the idea of protecting liberty. We had a more stable society, right? And so we have these liberal arts that we still are teaching now for us, but then we have the manual arts. So the liberal arts are how you maintain liberty. What are the manual arts? The manual arts are how you provide a living for your family. How you, uh, what you do to put a roof over your head, clothing, food, security, all those kinds of things. So when we talk about liberal arts at Monticello College, we're talking about the, the, the combining of both liberal and manual arts. Okay, everybody good? All right. <clears throat> so to kick this off, I want to talk for a second about Executive Order 14067. Now, some of you are familiar with this already. We've, we've talked on campus a little bit about this already. But this is basically an executive order started in March of this year. And President Biden has been right on target with all the, the deadlines he has in this executive order. This is how to develop, or the process of, of developing, central bank digital currency. Okay, um, Central bank digital currency is currency that's programmable. It's not just digital money. It's, it's basically Bitcoin um, technology, okay? Chain block technology, but controlled by the government, not a freelance kind of, you know, they, they can't possibly let somebody get away with Bitcoin, so they're going to create something of their own, and they're going to outlaw Bitcoin. That's what's coming. That's my prediction. Um, the problem with this is this replaces the dollar bill as we know it. So the, the, what we'll have is we'll have digital currency as the dollar, not gold and silver or paper currency. It'll be digital, and all the rest of that will be gone, just like in 1933 when they outlawed gold, because they were trying to get people to use Federal Reserve uh, notes instead of gold and silver certificates. Same thing here. This is going to replace that. The problem with this is it's programmable. So um, first of all, it's central bank. It's not commercial banks, it's not personal banks, it's central bank, which means eventually when this is put in place, everybody, this is, again, this is the executive order of the president, this is where they're going. They're gonna, everybody here in this room will have a direct bank account with the central bank of the United States, Federal Reserve Bank. And they, <clears throat> your money will be in this digital form. So say they wanna do a stimulus, they wanna get everybody to purchase, you know, to buy more. 
They'll put $2,000 in your account and they'll put 30 days on it. You have to spend it within those 30 days. You can't save it, you can't hide it, you can't put it under your pillow because it's digital. Everybody follow me? Digital currency also means that they can dictate what you spend it on because it's programmable. Well, I can't buy a gun now. Yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah, you lost your chance. Um, so there's, got, there's lots of problems here. Now, this was signed in March of this year and is progressing through. And according to the executive order, if you read it, um, it says that they'll have legislation, or supposed to have legislation by this month, by November, actually. So they're a little bit behind schedule. But you should see legislation on this coming out very soon in the next few months. Um, furthermore, in August of this year, the Federal Reserve Bank of America announced that they, in May of 2023, they're, they're releasing the platform upon which all this di new digital currency will operate. It's called FedNow. So within the next year or two, we're going to be swapping out everything we know as money, and we're going to go to digital. You're going to have your own account with the Federal Reserve, now, or F Federal Reserve Bank, and that process starts uh, in May. Now, it probably takes some while to get it going, to get it all online, but they're kicking it off in May. Well, they got to pass legislation first. They've got to pass legislation. Pretty much a done deal. Probably. Probably. Okay, so this is just some insight. In addition to that, we have what's called ESG metrics. ESG metrics um, started out for investors. It was a way to get, you, you know, um, everybody, every institution has a credit score. You know, are, are you a good risk or are you a bad risk, right, to, uh, <clears throat> to loan money to? ESG started about 15 years ago. It's, um, it's uh, um, environmental, social, and governmental metrics. Basically, <clears throat> you can get a rating. They assign ratings to businesses um, determined but based on are they following the 2030 environmental concepts that make the earth better. And if your business doesn't do that, then people are less inclined, because you're going to have a bad ESG score, people are going to be less inclined to invest in your business. They're now starting to, uh, we're starting to find people who have ESG metrics uh, scores, ratings, on personal bank accounts. Starting to happen now. Just like the Chinese social credit system, if you're not familiar with that. If you're, if you're not familiar with this, go look it up. Five minutes on the internet, you'll know everything there is to know about it. It's been around in China for over 10 years. <clears throat> so that's where we're going. I see two possible futures. If you do absolutely nothing, stay exactly how you are now, you're going to be in the Fed now and ESG programs within the next 24 months. Some level of those. And it'll just progress over time. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a little um, disconcerting maybe, but that's where we're going. There's another possible future. If you don't like this future, I don't like this future. I'm not going to this future. I'm not doing this one. Then there's another potential future, and that's called the new economy. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. And when we talk about the economy, let's start at the very beginning. Economy, the word economy comes from two Greek words, oikos, nomos. And it means basically how to order the home. Everybody knows that all societies are made up of homes, of families. And as the families go, so does the country. Does that make sense? So if you have families that are really good at economics at the family level, that's going to that's gonna come over into the community level. That's going to come over to the state level, to the nation level, so on and so forth. So really, it all boils down to us again, always, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's economy. What is it? Well, it's buying and selling, goods and services, all the things on the list, and probably 10 others that I didn't put on here. <clears throat> Any combination of these. <clears throat> and there's no one definition of this. Yeah, shoplifting now. It's big now. Yeah, big now. OK. <clears throat> Why is it so important? Well, because it impacts everything you do. It impacts uh, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the car you drive. Uh, wh where you travel, where you vacation, what kind of job you have, whether or not you can get toilet paper, right? All of these things impact us on a daily basis. I would, I, I, I would venture to say that this might even impact you, the economy, more than most people's religion impacts them, right? 
So this is a big, big, big deal. And the problem with this is that we don't know anything about it. Most of us have no idea what the economy is, how it impacts our lives, what are the elements of it. Oh, we might, if we get unemployed, we're paying attention to the economy because we're looking for a job, right? We may, under, we may pay attention to in, insurance rates, food supply a little bit maybe, especially when we're out of it, right? Here's a whole bunch of other things that make up the economy on a global and national levels that we don't know anything about. Now, unfortunately, whether we know about this or not, this impacts our lives. What's happening in all these areas impacts our personal lives, down to the individual mom and dad, child. We know almost nothing about it as a nation, as a society. That's problematic. <laughs> Let me give you an example. How do we know if we have a good economy or a bad economy? Well, one of the <clears throat> most basic indicators is debt versus GDP. GDP is what? Can somebody read that at the very top there? Just out loud. Go ahead. Gross yeah. domestic product, GDP, is the total monetary or market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's borders in a specific time period. Okay, so basically what does this mean? Because a lot of people read that and go, yeah, wow, didn't understand any of that. Basically what it means is this. Let's say Carol here, she's super industrious. She, she has eggs, uh, chickens, so she sells eggs, and she mows lawns, does a little babysitting, does a little house cleaning. All those things she does for the whole year, all of that added up would be her personal GDP. So in terms of nations, we have GDP, the value of, of all of our, our production, and then we have debt. And we compare those two. If you've gone in to get a home loan, they did the same thing with you. They looked at all your debts, all your bills you had to pay, and how much you wanted to borrow, and how much money you had coming in, and they made a decision whether they were going to loan to you or not, and how much. This is not a new concept. We do it with nations. So we go back to this. You can see here <clears throat> that in World War II, 1940 or so, um, we had about 100% debt to GDP. That means if we have $100 income, we had $100 in debt. Good or bad? Bad. That's a bad place to be, okay? And then it dropped down, hung around 30, 40%. And then this was put out by the Congressional Budget Office in 2011. They said, as of 2011, if we maintain the policies that are in place right now in 2011, this is what we can look forward to in terms of debt to GDP. That means in 2050, we'd be at 400% debt to GDP. Ten or $100 in income, $400 in debt. Is that a good place to be? It's not a good place to be. Okay. Well, wait, which numbers are we using here? Um, I'm not, sorry? You're not counting unfunded liabilities, are you? Or? No, we haven't got there. This is just debt. Okay? I mean, in the debt column, what goes in there? Everything except those things. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything Congress talks about, that's in the debt column. They don't talk about the, the other parts, okay? Here's it's just another depiction of this. This gives you an idea of, um, of productivity, okay? And you, you can see, is that, no. Yeah, here we go, productivity. You can see here that um, how much input to how much we produce. Okay, there's a ratio there. You can see over here where in 1950 we were almost at a ratio of 10. Okay, and then you can see a steady decline here. Look at this. It just kind of goes all the way down to where you're about 2.5%. Has a few spikes. If you get a little closer in here, you can see this is January of 2020, July of 22. Not only did we go from 6 down to 2, we went into the negatives. Just another indicator that there's problems with the economy. Okay, there's ways to look at that. Another way to look at this is you take all the debt that we have and you divide it by all the people in the country. So if tomorrow we were going to pay off the debt, and this was the whole population right here, everybody, every man, woman, and child would have to pay a certain amount, and if you add all that together, that would pay off the debt, right? Everybody got it? So in 1970, that number was $6,600 for for you, uh, um, Michaela, and your husband, and any kids you have. In every family, same thing. By the time we get to 2008, it's almost 20,000. By the time we get to tw uh, 2014, it's almost 40,000. 
And this is projecting by the time we hit 2030, we'll need about 90,000 per person, man, woman, and child, to pay off the national debt. Oops, we're ahead of schedule. We hit that in 2021. It's going to be higher, much higher than 90,000 per person in 2030. Everybody with me? Okay, if you have questions, it's okay to ask. So national debt equals public debt, you're saying? You said public debt here, national debt before. Or... Yes. National debt yes. is public debt. Yes. Yeah, public debt. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that we have an unsustainable economy if we continue on the way we're going now. How does that affect us in our lives? Well, all these areas. There's only one group that I know of that is affected more harshly than, than, than your family right now, and that is um, young college graduates. Because they don't have a stable income yet. Many of them complain that they can't even find a job. And they have all this college debt that you sort of forgot about is coming due. Do you know what a $75,000 student debt feels like to a 21-year-old? It's crushing. Would you even care is a question I have? Well, yeah, because they have to pay it off. And all of a sudden, they're starting to get bills, which is why suicide rates of college graduates is going in because of this scenario. <clears throat> All right, there are two primary drivers that, that uh, move this, this unstable economy. One is the national debt, we just talked about that. Every time I give this lecture, I have to change this number. I give this lecture about five to six times a month. Every time I change it, I have to, or at least when I go out on the road, I have to change this number. So I put a plus there, just to kind of cover me a little bit. $31 trillion is national debt. Of the two drivers, this is the small one. The big one is what we call unfunded obligations. <clears throat> what are those? Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, pension, government, retirement plans, all those kinds of things. There's about $147 trillion in those. What does that mean? That means whenever you get your paycheck, they do what? Do you get what you, what you earned? Is that what you get in your check? No, it's not what you get. There's a thing called withholding. And they take money out for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these things, your pension plan, what investment things you might have going on. All of that is taken out. In fact, I venture to say, if I asked 100 people, how much did you actually make this month, they couldn't tell me. All they can tell me is the withholding, you know, what they have after withholding. They have no idea how much is being taken out. All the people who pay into this system have a promise from the government that they will be taken care of when they hit retirement except the government doesn't have any money left. It's paying out for every dollar comes in. Right now it's paying out somewhere between $1.50 and $1.75. Well, how do they do that? Well, it's called you print money, okay? That causes inflation, all kinds of things. So the amount in, of, of dollars in promises that we owe the American people, the government owes American people, is around $147 trillion. This is conservative. There are economists out there saying this is closer to 200, 000, or to 200 trillion, okay? Now, the problem with numbers like this is that nobody knows what it means. Let's look at it again. This is national debt, the red. The blue is unfunded obligations. In 2016, it was seven times greater than the national debt. Do we ever talk about unfunded obligations? No, we only talk about the debt. It probably caused a civil war or maybe people just wouldn't give a crap. I don't know. A question. Yeah. Um, now that interest rates have gone up, I don't know how much actually. Um, do, do, do you know um, how it's affected our national debt payments? Uh, I, I don't know. It's all flexible. Okay. Yeah, you're right because it, it changes, right? Um, but you can go to truthinaccounting.org, and they've got a really good clock on there that will show you to the second what's going on, based you know based on the inflation rates and all that kind of stuff. So when you add both of those together, again, th this is an old number. In fact, here, look at $918,000 per family. This was earlier. I got this updated. Now, this is as of November 29th, we owe these two together, and that comes out to $936,000 per American family to pay off the national debt. Family or person? This is American family. It's going up by a, almost two trillion a year right now. 
Aren't you super excited about those midterm elections? <laughs> will anything change? No. Oh, no, nothing will change. Here's the real question. How much is a trillion? Well, a million seconds is 12 days. Just let that sink in for a second. What do you think a billion seconds is? 31 years. Now look at the disparity between 12 days and 31 years. What do you think a trillion seconds is? 32,000 years. That's 32 millennia. 320 centuries. The United States has not been around that long. Western civilization has not existed that long. One of my students said, yeah, well, how long would it take us to spend a trillion dollars if we were spending a million dollars a day? I said, I don't know. Let's try. I'd, I'd love that. Would you like to have that opportunity? Yeah, that'd be great. 2,739 years to spend a trillion dollars, and we're almost 200 trillion in debt. Folks, this is never going away in your lifetime. This is not going away in your children's lifetime. This is not going away in your grandchildren's lifetime. This will get resolved one way or the other, but it's not going to get paid down. This is the economic situation we're in. Couple this with um, all these other things we talked about and with the idea that we have FedNow and ESG coming. This, if you do nothing, if you stay right where you are today and continue on that that path, this is the future that you have to look forward to. Massive amounts of debt, Fed now, and ESG. Go Google any of this. It'll take you 10 seconds. This stuff is all over the internet. If you don't know about it, it's because you haven't been looking. But it's all over out there. Every talking head is talking about it. Every economist that, that has a platform is talking about it. Apparently Vanguard today left the ESG program. Oh, that's awesome. That's promising. <laughs> the whole suite of funds, or just one or two, or? No, the whole, the whole Vanguard system. The whole suite. We've, we've had pressure, I mean, they're one of the three major ones. Right? Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad yeah, you heard that. That's actually awesome. good news. Right? Yeah, that's great news. So that's one possible future. When you have something that big, a big problem like that, people say, you know what, this is so big, we got to think outside the box. I actually think that's the problem. I think the box is the problem. We got to create a new box. No matter how you angle into the current system we have, you're not fixing this. The system is the problem. So we got to come up with a new system. How do we do that? Well, that's what we call the new economy. It's the idea of independent, regenerative living, local alternative currency, local production. Everything's local, local, local. Okay. All right. There's a few principles that you have to get in your head for us to talk about the new economy and for you to really understand what I'm saying. Everybody with me? Okay. First principle is the, is the concept of standard of living versus quality of life. What is standard of living? What does that mean? Well, it means stuff. The quality of your car, the quality of your house, your food, your clothes, all that stuff, right? Standard of living, quality of life is your happiness and tranquility. A lot of people say that if you increase your standard of living, automatically your quality of life goes up. Is that true? No, of course it's not true. You know people who are rich who are unhappy. You know people who are kind of church mousy, poor, and very happy. Can you increase stuff and increase quality of life? Yes, you can, but you got to work at it, right? It just doesn't happen automatically. I don't care if you want to spend your life going after, you know, chasing the Joneses. Knock yourself out. You want to walk around in a toga and pretend like you're Marcus Aurelius. That's okay too. But don't or stop telling our kids that they can get a higher quality of life by getting more stuff. We already have a consumer problem. Right? And this is a lie. And we gotta stop teaching it. That's our first principle. Second principle: personal financial autonomy. How long can you survive comfortably without a job? Most Americans, not very long. In fact, 76% 70, of all Americans, um, if a crisis happened, they couldn't come up with $400 to solve the problem. We're, we're in a bad place. 
How much debt are you servicing? Will you be able to survive and thrive if you lose your retirement plan? What resources do you own? Are they passive, renewable? Are you dependent or an independent? Jefferson talked about this. John Adams talked about this. George Washington talked about this. Are you dependent on the system, on the government, or are you an independent? Today we call that business owner and employee. I'll let you figure out which one's which. Number three, becoming anti-fragile. Uh, Taleb wrote a book uh, some 20 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, that's 10 years actually, that's the new math, uh, 10 years ago, talking about this idea of anti-fragile. What does it mean? Anti-fragile, in a nutshell, means this. There are two kinds of problems in the world. One, problems you can do something about. Two, problems you can't do anything about. But you can insulate yourself from the effects of those problems. Okay, we've got a farmer in here today, so I'm gonna use a farming example. Plus, that's what it says in my notes. Um, <laughs> farmers who know their trade, who know what they're doing, watch the weather, they watch the climate, they watch the cycles. Are there drought cycles? Everywhere in the country there are drought cycles. It feels like we're in one perpetual drought here, but we, 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 it's, a, it's, wet, it's a wet drought and then it's a dry drought, right? <laughs> So farmers who understand this, and they know in the big, you know, if it's 10 years or 12 years, whatever it is, they'll hold some off to the side. That's what the old farmers used to do. And they'd fill up those silos, and they don't sell it. Just keep there. So when the drop does hit, they have something to sell off during that time. They have something to eat, and they have seed for when the rains come back. That's called being anti-fragile. You can't do anything about the weather, but you can insulate yourself from the negative effects of that weather. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, right? Okay. That's that. Anti -fra being fragile is a friend of mine, he was an airline pilot for 40 years for a major airline. Got his pension, he's got his social security, he's got his pension, he's got quite a bit of money, five or six grand. This is 20 years ago, that, that's not bad. Five or six uh, thousand coming in a month. Bought himself a little ranchette, built a new house. I said, man, aren't you a little worried about putting all those eggs in one basket? No. Airlines is too big to fail. Within 10 years, that airline crashed, and uh, he lost all his pension, lost his house, lost his ranchette, and at the ripe old age, about 85, got to move in with his son. How exciting. Can he go back and rebuild? Probably not going to happen. Was it a good son or a bad son? <laughs> <laughs> Anti-fragile. We have total control over whether we are insulated from the negative effects of those problems we can't do anything about. But we have to be conscious of the realities and we have to look into the future. We can't just live day to day. This concept has been around since Aesop, grasshopper and the ants. But the majority of people live day to day. That's right. In fact, I'd say the vast majority. But I've invited you here today because I know you don't. So here we go. Oh. <laughs> now, to get this anti-fragile idea a little more in our heads, I went back 100 years and I'm comparing 1918 to 2021. Okay? About a 100 year difference there to look at where things were at. So <clears throat> if you look at the tax burden of the family in 1918, it was $233 per family. Adjusted for inflation is just over $4,000. The tax burden in 2021, um, according to what we just went through, is $936,000 per family. Why the disparity? Why do we have such a huge gap? This is adjusted for inflation. This is apples to apples. Why is this so different? One reason. Anybody guess what that is? We are living way beyond our means. We borrow everything. Here's a question. Think of people you know. Will they be living in the house that they're living in now if they couldn't have borrowed money to buy it? Almost nobody. Almost no one. How about cars we drive? Would we be driving the cars we're driving today if we couldn't borrow money? How about vacations? Yeah, Jenny's got that crappy car out there, but it runs. It works. Um, <laughs> vacations. Do people borrow money to go on vacations? People take out HELOCs to go on vacation. People get loans for Christmas presents. People, you stole my thunder. Would you have given out the Christmas presents you gave out last year 
if you couldn't have borrowed money. That's why you have this huge disparity here. They were living within their means back then, and we are not now. Okay, family expenses. In 1918, the average family was able to sustain itself somewhere between $50 and $80 a month. If you adjust for inflation, let's just call it $1,200, okay? Because it's a, it, it, you know, it covers an area there. $1,200 a month. Today, the average family in America, and I know it may not work here, but average for the whole nation is over $5,000. Again, $1,200 versus $5,000. Why? Because we're living way beyond our means. Make sense? We are super fragile here. They were very anti-fragile up there. Just a hundred years ago. But well, those numbers only have meaning if, if we have comparable income. So what was the average? We're going to get to that. Oh, okay. okay. 1918 gross income was $1,500 a year. Notice the net. Still, $1,500 a year. Why? Because there was no withholding back then, right? Total annual expenses was somewhere between six and nine. Let's call it uh, $750. That means that even though you had $1,500 coming in, not very much, they were only spending $750 a year to live. They had a 37% surplus, generally, at the end of the year. Look at us. On average, income in America right now is almost $80,000. Net is $61. Woo, look at those withholdings. Annual expenses, $62. We're in the hole. That's before you do those Christmas presents or the vacation or the boat in your backyard. Somewhere between one and 12, negative one to 12% in the hole each year. And we wonder why we're in such an economic problem. I submit that the reason we have such economic problems at a national level is because we have economic problems at a family level. If all the families were doing something like this up here, we would never elect those morons who go out and borrow a bunch of money or print a bunch of money. We'd never, we'd, they'd never, none of those guys would be in office. But we have nobody to blame really but ourselves because we bought into this debt nightmare. Am I freaking anybody out? Okay, it's all right, it's okay. Fourth principle, the new economy. Means of production. What does this mean, the means of production? It's pretty simple, it's, it's not a trick question. What does that mean? You stuff, you produce stuff. How you make stuff? Whose phrase is that? Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Why, because Karl Marx was all about trying to show that the state had the responsibility and the right to control how things were made and that people should be happy with what the state gives them and their cogs in the state wheel to make the stuff for the state to give to the people. Okay? It sounds like Klaus Schwab. It does kind of sound like Klaus Schwab. I wonder why that is. Now, there's two approaches to means of production. There's kind of a public approach and then there's a private approach. Let's talk about the public approach. Now, sometimes people say, well, in America it's great because we're a capitalist nation. True or false? Do people say that? People yeah, say all it. the time. Yeah. Are we a capitalist nation? No. What is capital? Money. It's extra money that you invest to make more money. The average American doesn't have $400. We are not capitalists because we don't have any capital. Now, there are capitalists here, but most of us are not. But we think we're part of this club because we all say we're capitalists. We're not. We're all just economic slaves. Sorry, but that's the truth of it. So, what that means is, since we're economic slaves and we don't have any capital, we don't have any idea how things are made. You go to Costco, I've done it. Woohoo! Got all this stuff, I got that, my things full. Man, and I don't know about you, but this is what I do. As I'm going uh, you know, in line to pay for the stuff, I'm wondering to myself, I wonder, what, where they mine the material to make this? No, I'm not asking them that question. I'm just, hurry up, I want to break into this thing and start eating it, right? Whatever. We don't ask those questions. We have no idea how to make the stuff we just bought. So here's the process. For anything you're doing, you get to mine, harvest, gather, collect natural resources. That's just basic, right? We're not harvesting off of asteroids yet, so that's stuff in the air, on the ground, under the ground, on the water, under the water. Those are the only places we can go. Everything you've ever used in your life, two things. 
was made on this planet and was made by somebody else probably. Okay? So let's walk through the process real quick. There's two processes, a growth and a fine process. You find the natural resources, you collect them, and then you manipulate them. Maybe you have this ore, all this rock out of the ground, and you're going to crunch it up so you can get this one trace mineral out of it because you're going to put it in a cell phone. Right? So you do that gross process. Then you take the fine process, you take those things that you pulled out, and you combine them, and you strip them, and you mold them, and all this, heat them up, and you make components so that we can assemble the finished product. Here we are, assemble the finished product. Then we package that product. Then we warehouse it. Then we wholesale it. Then we retail it. Then we consume it. And when we're done, we put it in a landfill. In a landfill. That's the means of production process that none of us have any idea for the most part. When I say us, I mean Americans. We have basically no idea how that works even on the things that we're dependent on. How about those drugs that we take? Wow, have a little problem with that. How about toilet paper? Anybody really good at making toilet paper? That had come in handy a couple years ago. This is the public approach to means of production and it's problematic. Now, my mentor, his name is Hilar Belok, he wrote in, in, 12, in 1912 a book called The Servile State. And in Surreal State, he said, if you want to have liberty, you've got to look at means of production this way. You've got to have a relationship with the natural world, and you go take stuff out of that natural world, and you're going to transform it to make it more serviceable to you. And that's going to be called wealth. And then you use labor to do that, natural resources, land, and then you have capital. We'll talk about that in a second. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to create some wealth, here I am in the state of nature, for example, like, you know, I've got nothing and I'm hungry. I find a stick, there's a potato plant, I dig down and I find a big old tuber and I dig it out. Now, I don't have to dig it out. I can just put my face down there in the dirt and eat it like a dog, but I'm not a dog. So I use tools. That's, I'm, 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 I'm uh, transforming this so I can consume it better. But I'm probably not going to eat it raw. Unless I'm really hungry, what am I going to do? Have you ever had raw potato? I, yeah, I don't like it. Um, what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to put it on my fire, on my coals, and I'm going to cook that potato. And one potato, let's say one potato is enough for me to satiate my desires for that day, good to go. But that could take me hours. i got to go find the plant, i got to dig it out, i got to walk out, and I have to walk back, i got to make a fire, i got to get the coals. Gotta, there's a lot of work. You can imagine, if you didn't have all these conveniences we have today, you could spend most of your day just eating, right? But let's say I found a potato plant with five tubers down there. I dig all five out, I cook all five, I eat one, I'm good for the day, I've got five left. When you have a surplus of wealth, that's called capital. Now what does that mean? That means for the next four days, I don't have to go look for food. For the next four days, I found a pond up on this hill, and there's a really nice corn, potential cornfield down here. I can dig a trench for those four days and get that water to come down to that field. I can improve my situation if I have capital. This is the most foundational concept of this. Okay, capital's not money. Money just represents capital. Until about 150 years ago, 200 years ago, most capital was in its form, its natural form. You had cinnamon, you had salt, you had wood, you had metal, you had this or that, and you would trade those commodities. It's only in our time, in the last 150 years or so, that we've gone to all cash, and we've lost total connection with this idea. Now that's problematic, because if you can't make stuff that you want or need, that means you are what on the people who can? Dependent. You are dependent on those people. That could be problematic, unless they're really nice. Here's some principles. Will you read it for me, Kate? All consumables are created through the means of production. Okay, duh. But not really. Right? You gotta think about this. What's a consumable? Anything. Anything you consume. Whether you eat it, you wear it out, you use it in the bath. You use the consumables from the moment you get up in the morning. I don't know about you. It takes me about three steps all of a sudden. Potty time, right? That old gravity hits that bladder. I'm using consumables from the get-go. Toothpaste, toothbrushes, food, clothing, hair, pro hair product. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so that's important. And they're all created by means of production, which means somebody is using that list that we just had, and they're creating those things that I want or need. Somebody read this, please. You are as free as you are independent of goods and services produced by others. Whoa. Let that register for a second. What does that mean? What does that mean, Jeff? It means we're not independent. It means we're not independent. You are as free. You have as much liberty as you are independent of the goods and services produced by others. This is a reality check. This is scary. Now, Kate's not worried about wheat or whatever grain you're doing out there, or even straw. I know I've got straw from you before. He's got all the straw. He doesn't need anybody. Forget you guys. I got my own my own grain. I got my own. But you probably don't have those those desserts that you like. Well, I need diesel and I need parts to make You need diesel and parts, that's right. Just make biofuel. <laughs> okay, but the, see, now we're starting to think, how could I make that? Or how can I farm without that? What, but the average person doesn't ever have these, their whole life never think about this stuff. Which means, as long as we're in a good economy, it doesn't matter. Be as dependent as you want. Until we're not in a good economy. Are we in a good economy? Mm -hmm. No. We're in a, well, a terrible economy. So what does that mean about this? That means that guy that's providing all this stuff may not be so nice in the future. Okay, what does this one mean? This is a little different. This is your relationship with others. Read this one. Your level of liberty and security is in direct relation to your consumption versus how much you produce. What does that mean? Security. It means that if you're living at this level and you want to have more liberty, you can choose to do what? Consume less. I know, foreign concept to Americans, but you can consume less. You can choose to live at a lower... Standard of living. It's a choice. Amazing. Not necessarily fun, but amazing. Or produce more. Or produce more. You have a choice. I know, it goes against all American logic, but you could actually get two jobs. <laughs> wow. Oh, I already have two. <laughs> okay, three then. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can do that. Imagine what happens if you get two jobs and decrease your consumption. Wow! We have all kinds of options. We're not locked in. But we have to be thinking about it, which is what we're trying to get you to do right now. Okay, these are the four principles. Standard of living, quality of life, personal financial autonomy, anti-fragile, and means of production. All right, now we're going to get into the new economy. All that scary stuff, was that a little... Is that a little unnerving, that whole economic situation? It is for me every time I give it. But we have to face reality, okay? So this is going to be fun from here on. The new economy is broken up into five elements. Library education, we talked about that already, but no debt. The two biggest problems or complaints that, that college graduates have is they have a mountain of debt and they can't find a job. We're going to solve both of those. So no debt. We don't take federal funding. And our tuition is one-third of the average residential college in America. So we're in a really good place. We've set up that our kids, if they will go home and work hard for the five months that they're at home, they can raise enough money, plus a little help from uncles and aunts and grandmas and grandpas. They can make enough money to cover their tuition for all four years, come out of here, no debt. That's a big deal. Secure home and land with no mortgage. What? Have a house with no mortgage? Yes, I'm going to show you how. Have land with no mortgage? Yes, I'm going to show you how. Independent, no debt, food source. I say 95%. I haven't figured out how to grow pineapples yet. I've got to have my pineapples. So uh, I'm leaving a little 5% there of, I'm choosing to be dependent, okay? I just, I, I, that's where I'm at. Okay, independent, no debt, <coughs> home, energy, and fuel source, and independent family business. These five things. When our students leave our program, if they do everything we ask them to do, and they're, they're creative about it, they're going to end up with these five elements. That's going to be their life. A little different than what we grew up with, yes? We were told immediately out of college, get a mortgage, get, get a big car payment, all these things. But the um, business environment, I think, is incredibly 
unfriendly to small businesses. Just, just bear with me. Just bear with me. I thought of everything. I sure you did. Now, when I say ages up here, I don't mean you can only do this if you're 17. I'm showing you this is the age group I work with. But there's people 40, 50, 60 years old, they can do this. Now, if you're in your 80s, I don't know if this works really well. Hopefully, you've already done all this. Okay? Actually, I know a few people in their 80s that have. Most have not. And they really, the best they can hope for is welcome to Walmart, unfortunately. And you've seen them at the door, and it just breaks my heart every time I walk into those places. Okay, let's walk through this. What does phase one look like? Can I get somebody to read this for me? I'll save my voice a little bit. Leader education is vital to developing the skills to become a centered individual, experience a happy and successful marriage, raise a family, independently provide for your family, follow dictates of your own conscience, contribute to your community, and make an independent positive impact on the world. Okay, that's what we're, our intent is for our students to come out with this kind of education. Is this productive? Does this apply to real life? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're giving them. Okay? So that's phase one. So, phase one, you go through this program four years later, you get your diploma, you have a little party, and then we recommend that you move right back in with mom and dad and eat their food. <laughs> By the way, this is the reading list for next year, for first year students. I'll just leave that up for a second. I just put it in, so I forgot it was there. 30 readings, 7,000 pages. This is not the whole program for four years, this is one year. 7,000 pages? Yeah. yeah. So we tell them, when you get your diploma, go home, eat your mom and dad's food, move in, and go get three jobs. Work your little self to the frazzle. Now remember, they're only 20-something. 22, 23 years old, max, right? Go work your brains out. 80 hours a week. Forget dating for 10 months. You don't need to date. What you need to do is create a cash base. If you can get 50 grand in your hands within 10 months, now you're going to approach the world from a cash perspective instead of a debt perspective. Everybody approaches it from a debt perspective. We're telling them to approach it from a cash perspective. Now, while they're working that job to get that 50 grand, um, we've shown them and talked to them about what kind of land they want to get based on what kind of business they want. So they're looking for land in those few moments they have before they crash, before they have to get back up and go to work again. And they find the land, and as they get their 50,000 put together, they go buy the land. Now, can you buy land still in this country for $1,500 mm -hmm. an acre? Yeah, you can. It's not right in the middle of town. It's going to be out of ways. We have farmers that we're starting to work with right now that are giving their farms to young couples. They want to give it to their own kids. The kids are saying, well, thanks, Mom and Dad. Can't wait till you die. Then we can knock all these buildings down and turn, up, turn them into subdivisions. And the parents are saying, no. We want this land to perpetuate producing into, you know, we want legacy. So they write their own children out of their will and they are bringing on apprentices to see if they can find the right couple matched up with them. And we're involved with some groups that are, 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 are doing that right now. So now you come out of this six months into your internship. The old man says, yeah, I think you're it. Write you into the will. They stay there until they're dead. You run the place. And when they die, you move into the big house. And um, you've got a farm. Could be 50 acres. Could be 500 acres. Could be 5,000 acres. This is real. This is happening. Okay, so um, you secure your land. You also secure temporary housing. We're not talking about nice housing. We're talking about 200 square foot housing. Becca and I have seen people doing this on campus. It's crazy. We had one kid. <laughs> he got married. Did he get married? Was it a week before school started? Yeah. Yeah. He got married a week before school started. I'm pretty sure his wife didn't know what he was doing. And he got himself a little temporary house, 200 square foot, little trailer, moved it on and moved her into that thing. I'm pretty sure she was bewildered. But she loved him and, you know, it was an adventure, so, so they did all right. <laughs> I'm happy to note now, several years later, they are on a little five-acre farm and got a nice market garden going. But this is possible. You have your land and your temporary housing. 
The second you get your 50,000 done, you buy your land, your housing, you move that trailer onto that housing, and you are now king of the hill. You have no debt, you have housing, and you have land on which you can produce. All you have to do is, <clears throat> is sacrifice 10 years of standard of living. The next 10 years. Choose to live way down here on a standing delivery scale and build up with no debt. The world is abundant. You put one wheat seed in. I've read, you can tell me if I'm right, Kate. I've read that you put one wheat seed in, you can get up to 200 wheat seeds on one, on one plant, on one stock. That's abundance. I try to kill vegetables up there on campus. I can't do it. Those things don't want to die. They want to live. If you work with that from a no-debt perspective, wow, you're going to have abundance. You're going to have a liberal, not politically, not Democrat necessarily, you're going to have a liberal, abundant life if you do it without debt. Debt sucks the very life right out of you. So don't do it with debt. That's what we're telling them. Okay. You sacrifice 10 years of standard of living, 23 to 33. Think of it. So they graduate from college, their friends go immediately into a bunch of debt to have a high standard of living, and they're way down here. Within 10 years, they're up with their friends, except they're living on one quarter of what their friends are living on, and they have no debt. Guess who's envious of who? Like Nicodemus in the night, they're coming over saying, how did you do that? <laughs> right? And if they're smart, they'll say, well, for a small fee. Yeah. <laughs> now, we believe that we can't tell our students to do stuff if we're not doing it ourselves. So, three years ago, Julie and I got some students together, and we built a tiny home. And this is where we live. Some of you have actually been up there. This is very small. It's 14 feet wide, 30 feet long, 400 square feet. It's the deluxe version. Why I love this so much, Kate? Julie can't invite any friends over. There's no room for me to sit. I love it. She has to go to there. I get the place to myself. But we have to show them that this can be done. So we have a house in town, as you know. Now, the rumor is that our girls kicked us out of the house and we had to move up here. But we chose to come up here because we wanted to we wanted to model how this works. Okay? We wanted to model how this works. Okay, so you get your land and your house figured out, then you start your business. We recommend a commodity-based business, not a service-based business. I'm not against services. Commodity-based businesses tend to weather inflationary times or uh, uh, economic downturns better than services do. If you're cleaning houses, that's great until the economy goes down. Mrs. Jones says, oh, I'm going to clean my house myself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but if you're in food, for example, pretty much anything in food, especially if it's a staple, People gotta eat, generally three times a day, right? So you have all these possibilities. Let's talk about baker for a second. Let's say uh, that you're a baker. That's what you start up. So you've got your, your land, you've got your temporary housing, you've got your little uh, uh, oven that you bake your bread in on a trailer, you can take it wherever, and you're making 200 loaves, 300 loaves a week. Not very many, but you don't have any overhead, right? Because you've got no, no debt. We know the profit margin on a loaf of bread, if you do it right, sourdough, because we make it on campus, is about eight and a half dollars. We can make a two-pound loaf of sourdough bread, really good sourdough bread, for $1.50. So that's what Tommy's doing. Tommy's making bread and he's selling it. And he's making $8.50. Well, $8.50 times 200, he's not doing too bad for this young kid out in his temporary housing with a happy wife because they're married and it's a venture and they're energetic and it's exciting and she's got her own little garden and all that. <laughs> now, here's the cool part. Because he's got no debt and he's got a huge profit margin, we have an economic downturn. Tommy's friends, they still need bread? Mm. Still got to eat. They can't pay $10 a loaf anymore. He's got enough profit margin, he can cut his price in half. Now, he's taking a hit. He's, doing it for, well, he's taking one for the team, but he still stay, has enough to stay alive, and his friends can still eat. Or work for him. Or work for him, whatever. But he's learned, he's got margin. He can play with that. If you have a bakery, if he's a baker and he's got debt, 
He can't lower his prices. <coughs> he's maxed out. People can't pay his prices. He's going to decrease his receipts. His business is going to tank. Have we seen that around here? We have seen that kind of thing around here during economic problems. So that's what we're telling them to do. Then you start growing food on that land, right? And we got news for Tommy. His wife loves him like nothing else. I mean, she's crazy about him, but she's not going to live in that 200 square feet forever. And after about a year, she's starting to get a little cabin fever. Oh, got a little baby bump going on. Guess what? Now there's going to be three in there. Not, not great. And she's going to start losing faith in him, but he's smart because what he's going to do, instead of building his 3,000 square foot house, which he can't do because he's not going to take a loan out, he's going to build it by phases. And if he's really smart and takes advantage of what we offer, he's going to get all the materials together and he's going to set up some, some basic tents and stuff and he's going to call me and we're going to set up a date and the whole campus is going to go out and we're going to build his house with as much material as he has in one week. Do a barn raising. Amish. And he's going to get phase one of his house, 800 square feet. Honey, we've only been in the little one for two years. Look at I have phase one done, 200 square feet to 800 square feet. That's like moving into the Taj Mahal. He just bought himself a couple more years, right? <laughs> a couple more babies before he's got to get the rest of the house done. See how this works? And it works fantastic if you're willing to start out at a low standard of living. Guess what? Most of the Gen Z's that I'm talking to these days are willing. Once they know that they can, they don't know that there are options. Once they figure out there are options, they're all over this. All right, phase three. Now you've been selling bread up here in phase two for three or four, five, six years, but now it's time for you to become a master. You have to develop a symbiotic relationship with bacteria and yeast. It's got to be a close relation, intimate relationship. And not only are you making bread now, you're making different kinds of bread. You're doing seminars on bread making. You're taking start and freeze drying it and then selling it. You're doing things online with videos and you're expanding your business. You're getting better at it. You're an expert and you're expanding your business. And you're growing more food so you don't have to buy as much. And guess what? All that surplus, because your expenses haven't gone up at all, all your surplus is going to finish the house. And by the time you're 32, 33, 35, your house is complete. You have a serious income producing business. You have a house that's done. And it only took you 10 to 12 years during the most energetic and vivacious time of your life. Why do we wait till we're 70 to build a house like this, to do all this? That's what most of us do. Well, most of us don't do it at all. We just end up in a rest home. But those who hit retirement, 60, 65, and like, finally I'm out of this rat race. We're going to go out and homestead somewhere. I don't know about you, but I'm a lot more tired at 60, what am I, 61, than I was at 55. I'm, I'm starting to, you know, slow down a little bit. Why did I do all this when I'm at these ages? That makes sense. We have it completely backwards in our culture. Wait a minute. You were faster at 55 than now? Yes. I can't imagine that. I was. <laughs> Sacrifice 10 years of standard of living for 60 to 80 years of quality of life, and the Gen Zs are going, dude, I can do that. We've been having a hard time attracting men to the college. Not anymore. Every boy that sees this, Either he wants to be an urbanite and stay in urban, which you can still do part of this in an urban environment, but most of them are like, no, I don't want corporate America. I don't want to sit in a cubicle. I don't want to do all that stuff. I want to go do this. So even as freshmen, they're trying to figure out what their niche is. If any of you met Jaden this year, Jaden got the concept of compost. He's going to be the compost king wherever he ends up. And he's making compost. We, we can do a whole compost thing in 90 days. He's going to sell it. He's going to sell the extract. He's all over it. He's going to, next year, he's probably going to make 20 piles of compost. By the time he graduates, he's going to be expert at compost. He's already going to have clients. Yeah, I, you watch. I guarantee he's going to do it. All right. And then the last phase four is impact. 
Now that you have all this going on, you have people working for you, or it's family, you turn it over. At the ripe old age of 35 or so, <clears throat> you're basically retired, and now you go start helping the community, which is where real leadership starts, should stay. When people are great leaders, and then they go on to state and federal, we lose them. They all get poisoned. They should just stay home. Let's keep the, the good people at home, right? All right. The new economy leads to a 79% decrease in standard of living, family debt, and a 100% increase in quality of life. Why? Because if you don't have a mortgage, you're decreasing your monthly outgo by 42%. If you don't have a car payment, you're decreasing your outgo by 16%. If you don't have a food bill, can you grow enough food to eat to feed yourself completely? Yes, you can. Do we? No. Why? Because we don't know how. It's not that hard. If James was here, he would say, compost, people, compost. <laughs> you decrease your food bill, uh, you decrease your outgo by 21% if you don't have a food bill. Add those together, you're living on 20% of what your contemporaries are living on. And they're doing it all with debt, and you're doing it with no debt. Wow. No, man, no, no wonder they want to be like you. When we paid off our mortgage, um, we had, oh, this is what discretionary training kind of feels like. That's right. It's amazing. We get so used to that weight on our shoulders, we have no idea what it's like to have it gone. Most of us never get there. Most of us die. We just pass that burden on to our kids. Jefferson said, it is the most criminal thing you could ever do is to pass debt onto your ch unborn children. Well, that's what we're doing right now with 140, with nearly 180, 180 trillion dollars of debt, plus all the personal debt. That doesn't count, personal debt. All right, two possible futures, Fed now and ESG, or the new economy. And you get to choose. You're not forced to do one now. At the moment, wait two, three, or four years, you might be forced to do one. It might be too late to do this one. I don't know. All, all I know is that the new one is coming in with tentacles and it's very, very, very controlling. Just go look at the last 15 years of China and see how the social credit system has worked over there, which is not hard to do. All right, real quick, I'm gonna walk you through what's going on campus. Um, some of you have not even been on campus, I, I don't think, so let me just kind of walk you through. This is kind of just a little student life. We, uh, we do a lot of hiking. This was, uh, we did uh, Dark Canyon uh, at the beginning of this year. It was fun. Okay, a lot of work. Whole campus is work. For those of you who've been up there, you know it's work. If you come up and stand around for more than 15 minutes, we'll probably put you to work. Um, uh, we have a dorm we just built. This was last year. This was fall of last year where the students poured this 40 foot by 40 foot foundation. They dug the footings, they tied the wire, everything. They did, all, they did the whole foundation. I may have to take one of these big TVs around with me all the time. This, this color is really coming in nice. Um, students show up in April. We go from April to November uh, for our school year because students need to be there for the, for the growing season. So Julie and I have to go up and start uh, the beds. We have 20 of these beds in this one greenhouse. We have, we have four greenhouses. Um, don't, they're not all in operation at the same time, necessarily. So we plant in uh, February, late January, and this one looks like in March, this one looks like in May, and this one looks like in July. We have a land race seed program going on there, which means that we buy seed from somewhere and then we harvest our own seed. The best plants that we have, we harvest those seeds, we plant those again. Within three to five years, you guys do something similar probably, um, we have a seed that is acclimated to our little plot of ground. And, we, and it produces much, much better than the first year that it came. So the kids are all, all involved in that. It's fun. Turkey eggs versus chicken eggs. Never again. COVID-19, never again. <laughs> yep, I got a lot. And you can see all this can. Um, we do somewhere between 200, what's the most we've ever done, Be Becca? Oh, I don't know the numbers. <laughs> but we've done a bunch. We, we've done a bunch. I would say somewhere between two and 300 quarts of canned whatever. This year happened to be a lot of venison. We had three deer donated to us. And uh, so we, we, we'd get a call and we'd stop everything and process that deer. So we've got, I don't know, 100 quarts of venison stew uh, uh, there. We, we, did, we, did, we did a bunch this year. 
It's cool because they process it in the fall generally, and then they come back in the spring and eat the food that they processed. This is a lost art. None of these kids coming know how to do any of this. Occasionally one or two, but almost none. This is lost into getting them back. We are a Second Amendment school. We believe Second Amendment is important. We found that most people are afraid, who are afraid of guns are because they've never shot one. So everybody gets to shoot. Every once in a while, we have somebody who's a little reluctant to shoot. I say, no, you don't have to. Everybody else starts shooting, and they're laughing. Right in there shooting, no problem. Yeah. What percent of your students have never shot? I don't know. Maybe half. Okay. We, 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 we attract quite, quite a few. Um, we also allow students to carry what weapons on campus. You have to meet the state standards, which is you have to be 21. Um, we're constitutional carry now, so we don't have to, there's no background or anything. But, um, so we'll never have a mass shooting on this campus. There's too many of us carrying. Uh, I had to throw it in, honey, I'm sorry. Uh, we have a better picture. This is my daughter. She's very, very intense. Oh, I will yeah. kill you, look. <laughs> All right. Just turn her name at you. Um, yeah. we, Karen, uh, this is Karen last year or the year before. I just, I remember she said something about, we don't need chickens or we need meat or we want a roasted chicken or whatever, or some roosters. And I said, well, go down and get them. So they did. And so uh, they're, I think they're skinning these ones. And what, what an experience for most people. Never done this. I've heard most people have a hard time buying a whole chicken and cutting it up, let alone, you know, slaughtering. Um, we, we have a, a, a horizontal hive bee program that we're just developing right now. Pretty excited about that. This is an insulated. Uh, Bees in our kind of climate, we have somewhere between 80 and 90 winter kill, and 90% winter kill. Yeah, because we're using hives designed for Texas, all right, for South Carolina. These are insulated hives. They're, they're out of, uh, the design is out of Russia. Um, it has walls about that thick. It's all full of wool on the bottom and the sides and on the top. So we're going to have workshops this year coming up on this. It's really exciting. It's 20 frames deep, and the frames are almost twice as deep as the regular lens strung. So the bees don't run out of, you know, these work great if you have a if you have a 60 day winter, but if you have a five month winter like we do, you need much deeper frames. Do bees hibernate? Um, they kind of go into stasis. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Is that new this year? Those boxes? Yeah. Yeah, it's on campus now. I I, I show you if you come up. Um, we have this big room. This wall is actually done now, or it's starting to be done. It's <laughs> up. Uh, we, still, we still have to finish it, but we have this room for big classes. We do a lot of smaller classes. This is um, this is Will DeMille. He is our director of Georgic Development, and uh, this is a greenhouse. Uh, what time of the year was this? This was April. Yes. April of this year, and he has massive food. We, Julie and I were just there two weeks ago. He, it looks just like this in there right now. That's the one we need, right? That's, yeah, it's 160 feet long, about 40 feet wide. We're going to build a couple of these on campus. And uh, so when we're doing that, we'll let you all know you can come up and help us. Uh, you see all these big rocks? It's really amazing. All these, these crevices and stuff, he had tomato plants growing in here. This is in November. We were just there. Tomato plants that everything inside the, the, the rocks was still producing. Anything that went out past the rock got, got burned off with the frost, but everything really? in the rocks was still totally growing and green. He had so much food up there, it was crazy, ridiculous. Anyway, that's his job, and his job is to turn our campus into this. Um, we have uh, what's called micro semester students. They come for 26 days. When you say college, you don't think this, right? So people aren't sure what we're doing. So we create this micro semester program. We get about 15 students a year coming up. Uh, this girl is what micro semester. She just got through that day. She, we just kind of dropped her in, and so Abby is kind of getting her up to speed. And within about a week, she was loving it. She's coming back as a full-time student um, in 23. Um, this little rat fink, this is the photo bomb going on here. He didn't do one stitch of this work, but the second he saw the camera, I jumped in and made it look like he was working. These three little girls here. Politician. <laughs> These three little girls here did um, about 1,400 square feet of ceiling, oh, four by eight sorry. foot sheets of sheetrock by themselves. These kids know how to work. 
and obviously take, a, <laughs> take advantage of opportunities. The future Paul <laughs> Um This was fun. Uh, what's that outfit out there that flooded? Glamping, Canyonlands Glamping. Canyonlands Glamping, and uh, yes. You should go back to that picture. Underneath those sticks is that 40 by 40 concrete slab that you saw earlier. Yeah, that's this right. is a straw bale building that we built this year, and the students. We've got some fix of that here in a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we did some service, they got flooded out, and we helped them out, it was fun. That was all because of, uh, of Carol and others, and, and so we said, of course, we'll come out and help. We still haven't received a check for that item. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, uh, survival skills, more hiking, um, all kinds of stuff. This is us uh, processing those, those deer. She's a vegan, she doesn't even eat meat, but she's getting into it, man. Look at that, determination, look at that face. <laughs> Um, alternative no dead construction, these are uh, compressed earth blocks. Uh, this is one thing that we tried on campus. We built 2,000 blocks ourselves. I think we did that in two days, just about foot Mark and I in, in the, in the uh, hospital, but, um, but, but they were great. You build walls with this stuff and put plaster on like you're supposed to with the right kind of overhang, this is a 300 year wall. Straw bale, uh, this, we built three of these buildings now, uh, Mark and I have. Two on campus and one in Missouri. We just built one in Missouri this year as well. And uh, just, it's so fun to have these students out here. Uh, we brought some other people in as well. This is that slab that Mark was talking about. We started out here. We went from the slab to, um, to uh, the, the building with the roof on it here in a second uh, in six days. 1,600 square feet of living space. Six days. It wasn't completely finished. No, but we had we had a we had a roof. On. We had a roof on. We were keeping the rain out of the out of the building. That's a this is a load bearing straw bale building, not post and beam. All the way to the roof is on that straw. It's R thirty six in the uh, R thirty six or thirty two R thirty two in the walls R thirty four with the plaster. Um, it's cool. You guys can come up anytime and see it. It's not going anywhere. This is the micro semester program we talked about. We can only, because of our housing constraints, we've now, once that building is done, which I'm hoping to have it done soon, uh, before school starts in 23, um, we'll be able to house about 30 students. So only 25, because we have to leave, leave beds open for these guys. And I'm hoping to get about 20 of the micro students. We usually get about 15, and we're hoping to, to bump that up. 70% of the micro students who come come back within a year or two as a full-time student. Here's what we charge per year. This is what the average residential college in America is per year. Okay, can somebody read this for me, please? When it comes to time of crisis and increasing tyranny, people will make one of two choices. They will comply or they will resist. And that choice is almost always determined by their skill set and their principles just prior to the full onset of crisis. They who comply, comply because they have no other options. Those who resist do so because their framework of principles provide them a, li a liberty mentality and they have a certain skill set that allows them to be independent of an ever-expanding power structure. I'm fed now. Or the new economy. Um, Which economic future do you choose? Um, so they will comply, comply because they don't have an option. I've always wondered about that. Um, in, in a very small role, for example, at work, there's a new program that's being rolled out. And they are, frankly, stupid. And so I talked with one guy about some aspects, whatever, and his notion was, yeah, just go along with it. Just, just go along. And I said, well, do you ever raise your hand? Do you ever ask a question? No. <laughs> and, and so, um, just got to get to retirement. That, based on a survey of one, I'm inclined to believe that uh, those who comply, they, they want to comply. Not because they have no other options. Well, maybe they don't see any options, but they comply because they want to. They'll jump on that bandwagon, whether they like it or not, but they'll jump on the bandwagon. Okay? Yeah. All right. Any questions real quick? We're going to turn our camera off here in a minute, but uh, 
Any questions? This is a local crowd, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. <laughs> I'll just comment. Yeah, comment. <clears throat> Those of our society who have, maybe not, Jeffrey's got a brain, but <laughs> so many of the people who are employees have no idea that there is any other way. Right. And so, yeah, they just comply. So part of what we have to do is educate. And that's what your typical pool system gives them, is there's no other options. It's right. they have no brain to it's think It's learned about. helplessness. There you are. That's, they teach them how to be helpless. They can't think for themselves because they've never been taught to. All right, well, thanks for, for coming here, guys. Appreciate it. We'll get on to our other segment here in a second, but we're going to switch out the cameras and stuff, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Did you bring any donuts? <laughs> I'll get some.